Tell me why. Hi guys. Ready for, ooh, what are we up to? Chapter 21, chapter 21. So we ended the last chapter where Addy said that he didn't see Gaia the next day or the day after or the day after that because the school closed. Um, but he has Gaia's map. I wonder if he's gonna keep filling that in. Chapter 21. Most people were leaving. I could see them going from my window. There was a steady procession of people out on the pavements. They were carrying as much as they could in brightly coloured bags or dragging large suitcases behind them. All their belongings in the world. I spent a long time checking through the line of people to see if I could see Gaia and her family among them. I wondered if her dad had changed his mind and they were on their way to Brighton. Right now to her aunt's house. Or if her parents were fighting, not able to agree over what they were going to do and Gaia and her brothers trying not to hear the shouting through the thin walls. I had no way of telling. We didn't have a phone at my house. Mum had a mobile, but I didn't know where she kept it. I felt in my pocket for the map that Gaia had given me, and I traced the numbered dots with my finger until I came to rest upon Gaia's drawing of her block. I missed her. I tried to shake the thought from my head that I might never see her again, but I kept returning over and over in my mind, making me feel sick and panicky. The only thing that had calmed me was turning over the map that Gaia made in my hand. It was my last piece of her. I didn't have any photographs, only the pictures in my head and the worn paper map I was holding. I hoped that she had got, she had got out. I hoped that she had left her flat behind her and was far away from the piles of brick and rubble that now made up our streets. No one was safe in their homes anymore. Bricks and walls and doors didn't protect you any longer. Perhaps she was already there, in Brighton, down by the sea. I'd only seen the sea once when we went on a trip to the beach in year two, and it had scared me a bit. It was so vast, so unending, stretching on and on until, I met the, until it met the sky. Guy had held my hand as we waded into the shallow waters because I told her I was afraid and she'd squeezed it tight as the first wave rolled in and splashed us right up to our waists. I screamed, I think, but I didn't feel as worried with Gaia beside me. I wished I was with Gaia again. Perhaps I could have gone with her family to Brighton and escaped as well. I knew it was a good idea to get out, but the problem was I just couldn't go anywhere without Mum. I wonder if you've got a Gaia. Chapter 22. Michael's mum came round a couple of days after our school shut and told me to pack up my things. She marched into mum's bedroom and started shouting at her to get up, to save her son, to save herself. Mum looked right through Michael's mum as if she hadn't even been there. Turned over onto her side and went back to sleep. Michael's mum grabbed my wrist then and started half yelling at me. She said that I would go with them, that I would be safe then. She told me to pack some of my clothes, that she'd be back soon. I closed the door behind her and locked it with the big key we hardly ever used. I put the chain on as well. Then I pushed my chest of drawers to the front of the draw to the front of the door. It was too heavy for me to lift, so I had to move one side and then the other. It took me a while to move it like this in little zigzags, but I got there in the end, just before Michael's mum came back. She really started yelling when she realised I wasn't going to open the door. Even louder than she did at my mum. Addie! 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 She kept saying my name over and over. I even heard Michael's sister shouting my name, but it didn't last forever. And then I heard the footsteps fade away. They'd left too. I went out to buy some food from the shops after that. I knew it was dangerous, but we were running out again and we had to eat. I walked out of my tower, but before I turned towards the shops, I looked towards the ro looked down the road to see where Gaia's block was standing. Was she still in there? I counted the windows up until I found the 17th floor and tried to see through the dark panes. Maybe she was looking at me like this the very, at the very same moment that I was looking towards her. Just in case she was, I put up my hand and waved a little bit. And I started to feel silly, so I stopped and started running down the road to the shop. 
The one closest to us was closed with the grey shutters pulled right down, so I had to go to a mini supermarket that was down the road. There was no one else in the supermarket when I went round filling my basket, and there were lots of things missing from the shelves. I decided to buy some chocolate biscuits as a treat, the type that are filled with white marshmallow, and remembered to get some toilet roll for us too. The man who served me was very tall and looked quite nervous. He kept looking around us as if he thought someone was going to jump out at him from behind the shelves at any minute. I filled up a couple of plastic bags and their handles dug into my palms. I'd only got a few steps down the road when I saw the sign on the door had been changed to closed. I'd only just got there in time. The street was deserted and all of a sudden I felt very alone. There weren't many cars or buses on the roads either, which is very odd because usually the main road has a big traffic jam on it. People around here say it's the only thing you can really depend on. You never know if the sun is going to shine or if the day is going to go your way, but you know there'll be a massive massive traffic jam bumper to bumper on the main road. I didn't like the empty looking street. I didn't realise how much I liked the busyness of everything and how without it I felt more lonely. The bags of shopping were too heavy for me to be able to run, and walking slow, walking felt slow and tiring. It made me play a secret game which I have never told anyone about, not even Gaia. I imagine that I see an animal wandering behind me on the street. Maybe it's hiding behind a dustbin or creeping around the corner. It could be any animal. I've had elephants, giraffes, horses and even rabbits in the past, although usually it's a cat or a dog. Sometimes the same ones come up without me even thinking about it. There's a black and white dog that often turns up and a small tabby kitten that I've seen a few times. I imagine that the animal is following me home, so every time I look round, I can see it there behind me. By the, next, by the time I get back to my block, it comes up right next to me so it's by my side, and then we walk up the stairs together to my flat. I always take the stairs on those days because it's fun to imagine them running up in front of me and then waiting for me to catch up with them, all balancing on the banister and then leaping down in front of me. And I don't think that animals like the lift. It makes them feel that they're trapped. Then, when we get back to my flat, I feed them their favourite food. I make this part up too, of course. I don't put down real food or anything like that. Then I just make them a bed for the night and that's it. I guess they are imaginary friends of sorts. That's why I don't tell anyone about them. Because I don't want people to think I'm weird. I don't talk to them or anything, other than in the normal way that you might talk to an animal, like, here boy, or it's okay, don't be scared, or I won't hurt you. But actually, I do all the talking in my head, otherwise mum might hear me and I'd wake her. The animals don't really have names either. The other thing is that they're always gone in the morning. The first time it happened, I spent a long time looking for the creature everywhere, even under the bed and in the kitchen cupboards, just in case it got trapped or lost somewhere. But it was nowhere to be found. I still spent a while looking for them in the morning each time, just in case. Perhaps one day it'll still be there when I wake up and I won't feel the stab of sadness that I'm alone again. That day, it was the black and white dog who strolled towards me. And because he knows me now, he gave my hand a lick and looked at me in that loving way that dogs do. I was glad to see him. I gently stroked him from his eyes right to the back of his head, just the way he likes it. As we walked together, he stood close to me and I put my shopping bags into one hand and kept my other hand by by my side so I could feel his soft fur as we made our way back to the tower. We didn't meet anyone else on the way. At one point he sniffed the air as if he could smell something, but then he carried on walking and soon enough we were back at my tower. We climbed the stairs to my flat, the dog bounding a few steps ahead of me all the way and then turning every once in a while to see where I was. He slept at the bottom of my bed that night. I fell asleep more easily than I had done in a long time with him there. When I woke in the early morning, when it was still dark outside, he was still there.
sleeping in a tight circle his body made. But when I woke in the morning with the sun streaming through my curtains, he'd gone. I thought I could see the indent his body had made in the duvet, which felt warm to the touch, so maybe he'd only just left. I didn't spend as long looking for him this time. I knew in my heart that I was alone once more. Do you think I did the right thing, not leaving with Michael's mum? I wonder, what would you have done? And why do you think that he's imagining all those animals to come by him? Do you think it's because he feels like he needs the company? Do you think it's because he feels alone? Do you think it's a comfort to him? How many of you have got dogs or cats or rabbits and when you're feeling sad you just give them a stroke? You might even do it with a blanket or a teddy. We all do that, even adults. It's a comfort. Maybe that's what Michael needs. Oh, looking forward to seeing the next few chapters. See you then. Bye.